Yo, yo, what's up, everybody? What up, Picture this, a new teen, 15, barely keep a routine, the room clean. Who thinks that she figured out all of the mathematics? Missing school, only had to hear the mouth of one parent, but plenty of talent. Mixing syllables, thoughts, and patterns on a palette. Treat a body like a palace, don't smoke, drink, or act callous. Shit happens, of course, but use the music as an atlas. Didn't do a homework, but that homework and on a track list, but on Average people think she messing up. Getting arrested cause she can't keep her hands tucked. When bitches start dissing and pinching punches to the gut, she erupt like what and tell them something they could suck, corrupt. But hold up, behind this raw emotional glut, she use a pen and paper to dig up out the rut. Them same things that wake up when a night rough, shorty let that beat thump, thump, thump. That's what she call love. Deeper learning, what's going on? <laughs> I, I got to be honest with you, I don't feel like I learned anything in school. And it's sad to me because I spent so much of my life there, and as I'm hearing Sam talk about all of the young people that we've worked with over the years at AS220, and I'm sure so many of the young people who are in traditional schools who don't have these amazing missions and this like attuned awareness to young people's needs like so many in, people in this room do, so many of us go through school feeling so unseen, feeling unheard, and, and also criminalized, right? So when I think about when I didn't learn in school, I've been reflecting on this, this keynote, and it's been really important to me, because I think for a long time I used to joke about not being a good student, and I would label myself, I wasn't a good student, I don't like math, I, I, I wasn't that great. And honestly, preparing for this keynote really helped me reflect in a way that I think I needed to because it was never that I wasn't a good student, right? It was that the things that my teachers wanted to be, me to be attuned to, like the math problem, the page number, the content, it was really hard for me to focus on those things because I was locked in, but I was locked in on something different. I was locked in on the people the politics and the power of the school system at a very young age. And because I was locked in on those things, I couldn't be quiet. I had a warrior spirit in me ever since I was young. And unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes I didn't know how to let that out in a productive way. And unfortunately, my teachers and the school administrators did not know how to receive it in a productive way. So what it meant is that very often, I was in in-house suspension, I was in detention, or I was suspended. And if I was none of those things, I was skating out the door <laughs> without permission, right? And I was finding my own ways to educate myself. I found a way to invest in my education in the way I needed to because I didn't feel like my school was doing that. I was getting in trouble for things like calling out the fact that if I was wearing shorts too short, I would see a white girl who was skinnier than me wearing the same shit, and she wasn't getting in trouble, right? I was calling out the fact that if I was rocking a bandana, because I saw Nelly rock it on BET, or upside down visor, which I used to wear <laughs> all the time, you know, why is mine considered a bandana and hers considered a handkerchief? You know what I mean? So there was like a profound legacy of anti-blackness in my school, and I saw this playing out as a young person, but couldn't name it because I didn't have the words yet. I didn't realize at that time that what I was seeing was injustice. I just knew I was pissed, and I was mad, and I was acting out because of it, or just downright refusing to go to school. And so it was really a blessing to me when I found a space at AS220 when I was 13 years old, and I walk in, if you can just picture this, you're on the south side of Providence. I know not everyone's, anyone ever been to Providence, by the way? Whoa, all right, y'all, okay. I was like, I'm gonna see like one hand and it's gonna be Tony. <laughs> um, south side of Providence, my sister Amber and I, she looks like me, we're twins. We're not really, people think we are and we don't correct them at all. <laughs> my sister and I, we were backup dancers in this crew called Project Heat, which actually our mentor used to, um, we, we didn't, 
We used to dress a little scandalous back then, so they used to throw us turtlenecks and call us Project Turtleneck, so that's why I wore one there. But still had to, you know, sass it up a little bit. <laughs> we walk in there as um, backup dancers, because our friend Suave, who was a local break dancer and a rapper, was like, yo, y'all want a backup dance for me? We're like, oh, hell yeah, you know, like, we, we can do this. He's like, I heard about this youth program on the south side that's hiring. So we walk to this car garage on this kind of shady looking street on Norwich Ave. <laughs> and there's like this gated like window that has a poster that says, youth performers wanted, we'll pay minimum wage. And it was like $6 or something an hour. So me and my sister were like, word, that's more money than like we ever could imagine to backup dance, you know? So we go in and I swear to you, Sam keeps talking about these portals. It was literally like exiting one world and walking into another. I walked in and I saw a big open space and there were like conga drums on one side with this woman named Nisha who was just like this Indian woman just drumming with like this like weird white guy with glasses who's also drumming and like this little kid who was like, I don't know what he was doing, but he was just like <laughs> doing it. <laughs> I look like directly in front of me and there's like this table of they look like they look like rappers but they weren't rapping they were writing in notebooks like quiet you know what I mean they were right I'm like what are they doing I found out that they were working for the hidden truth magazine and they were writing poems and doing record reviews and they were like editing interviews and then and then right next to them they're having this quiet writing session you have break dancers just spinning on their heads, like they're not even like noticing the fact, like I'm, how is this even possible? Then you have these little cubicles over to the, to the right side and you would see like some like young people or, or staff, you couldn't even tell the difference, right? <laughs> right, like some people were sitting like on the counter, there was like a makeshift studio in the back, people were spitting, but all of this, this multidisciplinary world that I walked into was everything I had been looking for. And I remember going into that space was the first time that somebody passed me the book, The Lives My History Teacher Told Me, or something to that effect. I never read it, but I touched it, and I was like, yes, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like, I know it. <laughs> but it was at that time in place that everything I had been feeling, everything I had been feeling in my traditional kind of high school, with well-meaning people, you know what I mean? Well-meaning teachers. Now that I'm an adult and I have kids of my own, I'm like, yo, they were just stressed, like, honestly. They were stressed. The way she was sucking down that coffee, bro, like, nah, like, she was stressed. <laughs> and I, and, I, and, and I, it took me a while to realize, like, teachers are handcuffed in so many ways to the curriculum by the state. And I think at a young age, I, I couldn't, I didn't know, I couldn't process that. I thought they were just, like, honestly, just trying to be oppressors. And I didn't realize that they also were oppressed, you know what I mean, in, in this weird way. And we're all in this system that we want out of, but we're kind of chained to each other in a desk. But in this space, it was different. It was like folks were unchained, right? They were unchaining themselves through breakdancing, through graffiti art, through conga drumming, through writing lyrics and interviewing people. And my sister and I just immersed ourselves in that world. I learned so much. Sam talked about the, the uh, staff meetings. I remember my little brother Tyrell, who was like four at the time, coming through, fully welcome. We'd be having a serious discussion. He'd come in the middle and take his shirt off and start dancing, and everyone would be like, hey, go Tyrell. I learned that family was welcome at AS220 Broad Street Studio. You feel me? I learned to this day, when I became um, a teaching artist and then later the director of the, um, of the youth program, I had so many students who taught me so much. I remember one day going head to head with my boy Day Day, who's like, you know, a decade younger than me. <laughs> Day Day is this like real good looking guy with long locks and, and he gets kind of fiery, you know, and so am I. And we got into it over something in the recording studio and it ended off, I know Janae, you were there, I think. <laughs> it ended off in a standoff in the, um, in the hallway of the youth program because he was unwilling to budge on his square. And I'm, I'm bullheaded too, and I was unwilling to budge. It got into this back and forth. Yo, I'm calling my cousins. I'm like, call your cousins. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, it ended up where we, you know, we had to take a break from each other. I'm the adult, so I was like, all right, I'm going to chill. Don't call your cousins. I'm not fighting nobody. <laughs> but... Me and Day Day are tighter than ever, you know? And, and right now, unfortunately, he is doing a bid right now, but we're, we're, that, that's my little brother. 
And it took me some time to realize, like, you know what? Sometimes it's not about being right as the adult. If this young person's so inflamed and so impassioned, just back down. And in that moment, I should have backed down. You know what I mean? I, and he taught me that. And our relationship is so much tighter, right? I learned so much from going to the training school that Sam spoke about, working in the youth prison with both the young men and the young women. I learned from my boy Shaq, who was one of the youth out there in the training school, that again, like, leadership comes in all forms. And yo, if you think you're going to walk into a classroom at the training school and be the leader, <laughs> you got to get through him first. <laughs> right? And I realized that there was no amount of um, trying to posture or play the authority card that was going to buy his trust or the trust of the students. It was about a one-to-one -one relationship with me and Shaq. And then once Shaq trusted me, he was able to help me co-teach the class because we had put that time in together. And so there, there's just so much beautiful like magic that happens in a place like AS220, in youth programs all around our country, in places like High Tech High. I've heard so much about this place from Sam, um, and I'm just so honored to be here today. Um, yeah, and I, I don't want to keep on rambling, but I, I just, I'm really overtaken by the love and the joy and the smile. I can see the smiles through the mask, which is really cool. <laughs> and I'm really excited to be here. We have a fun a a morning, afternoon in store for you, so thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Angel. So we're going to move to act two here. Hopefully that got you all warmed up thinking about people in your life who, you, who have taught you, who you've learned from. Um, do you want to explain a little about where this is going and then I'll get into like the nitty gritty? And we have some student ambassadors who I think are going to pass out paper and pens to anyone who needs it. So this would be a good time for that to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. So again, referencing that Monday uh, community meeting that we would have at AS220, I think about the power of the circle, right? And the power of the circle shows up throughout history, whether it's in drumming circles, campfire storytelling, right? Whether it's b-boys breakdancing or MCs battling, the power of the cipher, this decentralized intergenerational learning space is something that we bring into our classrooms and have remixed education around that philosophy. So today, we're gonna ask that y'all cipher up. You wanna explain that? Yeah, so uh, we're gonna get y'all to rap. Um, but don't, don't be scared. If you're like, I, I saw somebody on this stage uh, yesterday spitting something he had just written. Hey, hey. <laughs> you don't need this. You gotta, you gotta write something fresh and original. Um, if you're comfortable writing, you can write however. But for those who this is newer for, um, we're gonna ask you to take a little risk and try to write something. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna play this beat twice. The first time is to write. You can write on paper, you can write on your phone, you can use this, you don't have to use this. But you're gonna write four lines, whether you use this or not. When that beat ends and DJ Juni drops the air horn, <laughs> funk flex, bomb drop, whatever it is, uh, then we're gonna stand up and actually form ciphers like what Angel just described, and we're gonna share what we wrote. So this is like, uh, what is it, a, uh, a real performance assessment? Um, show and show and prove. Um, so the beat is about four minutes. So we got about four minutes to write. We got about four minutes to share, and then we're going to come back together. Is that right? Did I leave anything out? That sounds good. All right, let's get it. So this is about to be a little messy because we're going to ask you to group up in groups of like five or six, and it means you kind of got to turn. You might turn your chair if if you feel comfortable standing up. You might stand up, but you just need to form a little group wherever you're standing. And we're just going to go around, and we're going to read out and share to, with each other. Y'all got that? Yeah. Any, any questions, Michelle? Anyone? In some encouragement, we put our students on the spot every day. So now it's your turn. All right. <laughs> That's real. All right, let's get it. DJ Juni, let's play that beat once more. By the time this four minutes is done, everyone has to go. So if you spend the whole time introducing yourselves, you're not going to get to it. So just jump right in. In Cyphers, we don't show up and say, hi, my name is Sam, and I'm here to rap to you. We just jump in. All right, y'all. Hey, 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 hey. DJ Juni. <laughs> Give it up for DJ Juni one time. <laughs> Killing the vibes. And everyone who's doing tech today, this cannot happen without you. Seriously. Clap yeah. it up. All right, all right, all right. 
We're gonna do like we do at AS220. We're gonna call one mic, one mic. So it's just a nice gentle call to attention. All right, y'all are good. I forgot y'all are educated, so y'all know how to. I learned this quiet coyote the other thing at a rap competition. Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, for y'all too. Okay, word. So we're, right now, we want to know if there's anyone about maybe two people who want to share what they have. Again, like it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just gotta be you. So can we get two volunteers to come through? Hey, you over here in the blue. Yeah, give it up, give it up. And over here? Yes, yes. I'm sorry if I miss people. I just went to the first two I could find, but yeah. I, I like this blue and yellow combo going though. It's really nice. Yo. Yeah, I gotta. Been rapping my whole life, check it. Yo. Yo, yo, check. Uh-huh, yeah. Do the best you can with the time you're given. When you give in to the stress in your system, you lose vision. Find the rhythm of discovery, so told you what's forbidden. Just the kids like they go driven, don't chain them in old systems. Inspire, the fire to climb higher is wider. When we wire, my desire to get out of the fucking fire. Ghetto harmonies are beautiful with voices and streets. Sound and music are kings and queens. These are our favorite things. Baby, baby, check it. Hold on, hold on. Before you step off stage, yeah. did you, you just wrote that? Yeah. Make some noise. He just wrote that. And now, we welcome Uncle Larry to the stage. MC Uncle Larry. Uncle Larry, do you want a beat or a cappella? What's that? Do you want music behind you or just? I'll be, I'll be very quick. Okay. I'm going to be quick. <laughs> this time I really will be quick. I know. Um, I was in the seventh grade in New York City. My math teacher was a very, very famous man. What's his name, Jeannie? Bob Moses. Bob Moses. Everybody know who Bob Moses was? Yes. The finest human being I have ever met in my entire life. And until he passed away recently, I had conversations with him. I know his four kids. I wish I had the time to tell you a lot of it. He taught me how to make tools and how to make things. But the most important thing to me as a teacher was when he came into our class, we were a bunch of idiots, of course, in the seventh grade, and he would come in. If you look at his book, which you must get and read, you'll see his face looking like this. It taught me math, but it wasn't about math. That was just a path to learn how to make things. There's another long story that happened, which I don't have the time to give, but I remember that day that something very unfortunate happened with a lot of students. And he was such a soft speaker that he told me and, taught and made me realize that soft is stronger than hard. And what he said was, do not create the other. Uncle Larry. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know the whole story of which Uncle Larry speaks, and I highly recommend that you approach him afterwards and get to hear the whole thing. We're, uh, we're about to give something away, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. I just want to make sure I'm at the right part of this. So I told you all a story earlier about a rainy... Saturday in a warehouse in Pawtucket. Okay, Pawtucket's in the building. <laughs> what are the chances? Uh, about 10 years after that rainy Saturday, I walked into a Baptist church in my neighborhood uh, in Providence, and uh, I didn't know exactly what was going on, but it was an MLK Day celebration that I was attending. And they started introducing the keynote speakers. And it was like the governor of the state, like one of our US state senator, US senators from the state, and Shane Lee, who was like an OG youth staff member from AS220. Had no idea he was on the program. He had no idea I was in the building. And he gets on stage and he's like, I'm gonna tell you all about my path to Kingian nonviolence. And I was just super impressed, like, and just proud, like, look at him shine up there. The, you know, all these dignitaries and whatnot. And the wildest thing happened. He said he, 
He said he was going to tell, he said he was going to tell, um, <laughs> he said he was going to tell us all about the three turning points in his life on his path to king and nonviolence. And when he got to the, when he got to the second turning point, mm, you got this, Sam, you got it. who was that? <laughs> Love you for that. Thank you. I needed that. Uh, he starts, his second turning point, he starts talking about this rainy Saturday in a warehouse in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. After Harmony and some of the other young people said they didn't want to share, of course we respected that, Shane pulled up a chair in the circle with the folks from RISD, and he shared some of his life story, and he sang a song that he had written for his mom who had passed away. How, do you remember how it went? I'm so confused. He's my baby daddy, so I remember. <laughs> <laughs> He, <laughs> I'm sorry I put you on the spot with that. that was, but I just, I wanted to get it. Um, I had no idea that was the first time he had shared his story in that way, in that song publicly. But here he was, like 10 years later, no idea I'm in the church, talking about that as the moment where he realized that his story and his art could impact others' lives and set him on this path where he now works at the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence. So even if I had not been in that church, that Saturday had been a lesson from Harmony and others. But getting to hear Shane talk about what that Saturday meant to him was a whole other lesson for me. In particular, about the, long, the importance of the longevity of these relationships. I mean, I so easily could not have been there and not had any understanding of what that day and that moment was for him. So us being in community with each other and staying connected over decades and decades is incredibly important. And we learn more about ourselves, our power, our responsibility, our relationship to each other. There's someone in a church today or in a community center or a school cafeteria or a graduate school of education forum talking about someone in here and the difference that you made in their life something you said, an opportunity you gave them, a challenge you gave them, maybe just a turn of phrase, you know, whatever it was. Somebody is out there talking about someone here. We have no idea. Suave doesn't know he got a, was being talked about. Professor Joy James doesn't know she was being talked about. My mom doesn't know she was being talked about, right? This is important. This past September, Donald Burroughs, one of the high school teachers I was talking about, passed away. And I learned about it as we often learn about things these days on social media. And one of my biggest regrets is that what I told you all today about the impact Donald made on me, I never told him, right? How easy would it have been for me to hop on social media? I'm trying not to shout out any companies. To hop on social media that he was on quite a bit and just tell him that. Tell him that he was one of the major inspirations to me becoming trained as an English teacher and doing the work that I do. So we have a gift for you all today. The student ambassadors are gonna pass around. I wanna give a super big shout out to Randy for doing the design work on this and Haley and Michelle for every time Angel and I had an idea and we were like, yeah, we'd like a DJ and we'd like to give out a little notebook and we'd like to do all these different things. And they're just like, okay, we'll design it. We'll make it happen. Um, so we're gonna pass that around right now. But it's basically another kind of Mad Lib like this that a Angel and I wrote. And my wife, Sunan, is here. She, yeah. She, yeah. yeah. <laughs> She, she, we, I was telling her what we were gonna do and she was like, people are gonna feel awkward like writing to someone they, have, they haven't talked to in 20 years to say something. So we gave you an excuse. It says at the top, like, I'm at a keynote with these weird people and they're telling me to do this. So sorry, but you know, I just wanna tell you, you made a difference in my life. So it has a big fill in the blank and we're gonna give you that. There's envelopes for it as well. And we really wanna encourage you to take the time, whether it's while you're sitting here right now or if you're rushing off to a flight when you're on the plane, Fill this out, take a picture, post it on social media, with tag them in it, or go old school and put it in the mail to them in the envelopes that we've got. But please, at least just reach out to one of those people and let them know about the impact that they've made for you. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I know like, um this story in this two decade in the making story that Sam and I have between each other, it sounds, it's been magical and I've learned so much from Sam. He taught me that hip hop is so much more even than a culture, it's a pedagogy, right? 
it's a way of life and it's a practice and how I relate to not only my students but my children. I have four kids. Um, and the cipher is something we bring into our household on a daily basis, right? Um, but the awesome thing is it doesn't even stop with me, <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't stop with any one of us. None of us are the beginning or the end. And that's scary, but that's beautiful. And I want to shout out my partner in crime, Janae Pina, who's actually the director of the youth program at AS220, if you want to give a wave. <laughs> Just bringing the youth studio to new heights and this... Um, piece about long-lasting relationships that Sam touched on I think is so important and that's what we try to do at AS220 and I know so much of the work that we all do is is like how do we make sure we can be in each other's lives for a long time because that's where the change grows. I often feel like being a teacher it's like you're setting yourself up for all these heartbreaks because we have to plant the seeds and then we have to walk away. And so often we don't get to see them bloom or we hear through social media that they were stepped on right, and it's heartbreaking. But I have the divine privilege of being able to see some of those seeds that I can't even take credit for, but I saw them in the ground. And they were planted at AS220 when they were nine years old. <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're now, they took my old job and, and are completely killing it. So without further ado, I wanna call up my little brother, Jake. 